today we are going to discuss the echocardiography of the valvular heart diseases and to discuss this uh, echocardiography today's topic we are having our experts dr ravi kasliwal from escort heart institute and research center new delhi he is the uh, director pro, uh, of dnb cardiology program as well as director of non invasive cardiology program of the escort heart institute and we are also having uh, dr vinayak agarwal he is also a cardiologist from escort heart institute and both of uh, our these two experts we are going uh, are going to discuss about this mitral regurgitation aortic stenosis as well as other uh, uh, issues related to the valvular heart diseases friends all of you are well aware about the fact that echocardiography is now cornerstone of diagnosing and quantification of valvular heart diseases to this echocardiography <coughs> is limited to providing qualitative morphological description of valvular abnormalities but nowadays with the help of doppler echocardiography uh, we assess we can assess easily the hemodynamics variables such as pressure gradients <coughs> and across stenotic bulb stenotic and regurgitating bulb orifice area as well as cardiac output and regurgitant volume and today first we are going to discuss the mitral regurgitation and after that subsequent topic we will discuss the other issues so i would like to request dr ravi kasliwal and dr binayak agarwal to initiate uh, this uh, discussion to this special session now last time i remember a uh, few months back yes, i think we have done the basics of echocardiography we have done hemodynamic information that you can get from echocardiography and we have done the commonest cardiac lesion that we see mitral stenosis now we are moving ahead today we'll do mitral regurgitation dr binayak is here with that then we'll do aortic stenosis and then we'll do aortic regurgitation before we start let me say a couple of things that generally lesions don't come in isolation so don't think that a person will walk in and he will just have mitral stenosis and nothing else and that truly is the strength of echocardiography that you can diagnose multiple lesions uh, without <coughs> blinking an eyelid but the clinical sense has to be correct so as i said last time i'm saying once again that it is extremely important that we have a clinical taken the the pertinent history we have clinically examined the patient we have taken his electrocardiogram read the electrocardiogram and then seen his chest x-ray and then we are ready to go and do a echocardiographic examination mind you once we do this we have a goal oriented study we will get much more information because as dr biplav said echocardiography today non invasively will give you everything about the patient's diagnosis will give you the hemodynamics will give you gradients across the valves and very importantly as we discussed last time that will also tell you how much pa pressures are there is it pah or pvh or what is it so with this brief introduction uh, i'll hand over the mic to my colleague dr vinayak who's a faculty in our department and since we have already done mitral stenosis we'll go straight on and do mitral regurgitation uh, we're going to touch uh, the basic aspects of mitral regurgitation and as you know echocardiography <clears throat> can be is basically aimed at uh, finding out the presence or absence of a lesion whether the mitral regurgitation is present or not the etiology what causes that mitral regurgitation and also if there are any associated abnormalities then these can be looked into mitral regurgitation is a very common problem which one sees in clinical practice and uh, with new modalities like mri you know you can see a picture of a very nice myxoma being displayed here mri gives you very detailed structural uh, distinction and uh, hemodynamics also can be derived then why actually talk about echo when you have newer modalities which are so good the simple fact is that echocardiography can give you enough information in few minutes with very little discomfort to the patient there is actually no discomfort the patient is lying comfortably and you derive almost all the necessary information which you require to treat that patient so when we talk about echo in mitral regurgitation we have to look at few important things like mechanism of mitral regurgitation the severity and also the status of the and what condition is the heart 
Now, etiology can be broadly divided into rheumatic heart disease or RHD as we call it, the ischemic etiology which can lead to dilatation of the heart and cause functional mitral regurgitation or a dilated cardiomyopathy, the mitral valve prolapse syndrome, the caudal rupture which may occur due to ischemia or infective endocarditis. Then in old age, the mitral annular calcification is also a very common cause of mitral regurgitation and of course congenital mitral regurgitation is a known entity. So let's take up these examples. I'll show you the example of rheumatic heart disease. You can see this is a loop of a apical four chamber view where you can see, I'll point it out to you that this is the mitral regurgitation. The, this is the left ventricle. This is the left atrium. During systole, the, there is a jet of blood flow which is color coded, which is going into the LA. It's almost, uh, you know, wall hugging. It is uh, hugging the left atrial wall. And you can also see that there is some amount of mitral stenosis because the valves are not opening at that well and th there is a turbulent jet going upstream. So this is a typical rheumatic heart disease where the, there is a commissural fusion, there is restricted opening of the mitral leaflets, and there is a combination of mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. The next example is of functional mitral regurgitation. Now, functional mitral regurgitation is caused by regional or global left ventricular dysfunction or remodeling, which causes the dilatation of the, mit the cavity, the mitral annular dilatation may occur, but the structurally the mitral valve is quite normal. So in such cases, you can see that on the left side, there is a uh, parasternal long axis view where you can see the left ventricle, the left atrium, which are both dilated. And you can definitely appreciate the less contractility of the left ventricle here. With uh, You can see that the almost a central jet of mitral regurgitation here, which is hallmark of uh, ischemic or dilated cardiomyopathy. The third entity is a mitral valve prolapse. Now, mitral valve prolapse is usually of and seen in patients who have connective tissue disorder like Marfan syndrome, who have myxomatous degeneration of the mitral leaflet, and there is, and also of the other valves, but here we're talking about mitral regurgitation. So there is on the left side, in the parasternal long axis view, that these are the two leaflets, the A2 and the P2 segments of the mitral valve, which are prolapsing into the uh, left atrium. And if you draw a line from the annulus from here to here, you can see that the, you can look at this diagram below where you can see that there is dipping of the mitral leaflets below the annular plane. More than two millimeter dipping below the annular plane is diagnostic of mitral valve prolapse. You can see the same patient with a prolapse with a eccentric mitral regurgitation jet hitting the posterior left atrial wall and swirling around in the left atrium. And another view in the 4C, four chamber view, where you can see the uh, very uh, extensive mitral regurgitation, severe mitral regurgitation filling up the, almost the whole of the left atrium. Now, there is an entity known as flail mitral valve. Now, flail mitral valve basically refers to a mitral valve leaflet which prolapses into the left atrium and the tip of the flail valve or leaflet points into the left atrium. So as the name suggests, flail basically means that the leaflet is almost without any support or restriction by the cordy. Therefore, it just prolapses entirely into the uh, left atrium. And such cases are almost invariably associated with severe mitral regurgitation. This can occur in uh, infective endocarditis where there is ruptured cordy and uh, or in um, even connective tissue disorders. Uh, so you can see a very thick jet of mitral regurgitation again, which is uh, bordering the uh, interatrial septum here and swirling in the left atrium. The 
more closer the zoomed view you can see that there is uh, a flail mitral valve now coming on to the second aspect so we've covered what the broader category of etiology now we come on to the severity of mitral regurgitation so how do you assess severity of a lesion whether it is mild moderate or severe we're going to talk about mainly the severe variety of mitral regurgitation and what the american heart association recommends uh, in 2006 the new guidelines they suggest that if you take the most commonly we take the jet area which means that the jet area of the mitral regurgitation in uh, and its ratio to the left atrium the area of the left atrium versus the area of the jet so if there is a small central jet with less than 20% of the left atrium being covered by the jet then it is a mild variety if however the central jet is thick with more than 40% of the left atrial area being covered or with a wall impinging jet of any size swirling in the left atrium then this is a severe mitral regurgitation i will come to vena contractor in the next slide so you can see in this slide you can well appreciate that this is the mitral regurgitation jet we have taken the area and then we have also taken the area of the left atrium and if this ratio is more than 40% then it is severe now there are two three things about jet area which you must know and that is that it is not a very specific or precise entity there are many pitfalls in taking a jet area only now color flow itself or the jet area itself is influenced <coughs> by the gain setting if you increase the gain or decrease the gain the color uh, jet area will change suitably then it depends on the pulse repetition frequency uh, the field depth which you have kept on the direction of the jet on what what is known as a quanda effect quanda effect is if the jet swirls in the left atrium and is wall hugging then you tend to underestimate that jet it may this quanda effect applies not only to mitral regurgitation but any other uh, jet which uh, is wall hugging or impinges along a wall in such cases you would underestimate the uh, severity of the lesion if you were just concentrating on the jet area so do not forget that you have to use this entity along with the other parameters like if the left ventricle is normal size left atrium is of normal size then obviously uh, the mitral regurgitation is unlikely to be severe if on the other hand it is a significantly dilated left atrium and left ventricle then you definitely would think that it was uh, a severe variety of mitral regurgitation now coming on to what is known as a vena contractor vena contractor is the narrowest portion of the mitral regurgitation jet which is downstream from the orifice you can see it here that there is this mitral regurgitation jet just as it leaves the mitral valve there is this narrowest portion or the neck you can call it you are supposed to take this vena contracta in two planes in the four chamber view and in the two chamber view and take the average of the two and then decide what is the vena contracta if the vena contracta is less than 0.3 cm or 3 mm less than 3 mm then it is mild if it is 3 to 7 mm it is moderate and if it is more than 7 mm or so 0.7 cm then it is severe mitral regurgitation and it usually is associated with a regurgitant volume of more than 60 ml and an effective regurgitant orifice of more than 0.4 cm square we will be discussing this later on now we come on to the quantitative measurement of mitral regurgitation up till now we were talking about the qualitative you know the you look at the color jet you're looking at the vena contracta which are both based on the color flow now to some hard core evidence that you know what is the actual volume of the regurgitant flow can we actually calculate that through echo we can now uh, before um, i go into the details you can see that we can we use basically the regurgitant volume and the regurgitant fraction to determine what is the severity there are again divided if the regurgitant volume is more than 60 ml 
then it is severe or a fraction if it is more than 50 percent then it is severe mitral regurgitation now look at this diagram where you can see that in mitral regurgitation the blood flow occurs from the left atrium to the left ventricle and during systole there is a back flow of the blood into the left atrium what you call as a mitral regurgitation now remember that the stroke volume which occurs at the left ventricular outflow tract or you know if you measure the stroke volume will be the constant whether it is flowing at the mitral valve or whether it is flowing at the aortic valve however in at the mitral valve the there is a pseudo stroke volume because there is a regurgitant flow back into the left atrium and that extra blood again comes through that mitral valve in diastole so the flow across mitral valve is actually uh, more than what you see at the LVOT and if you subtract the difference between the flow across the mitral valve and the LVOT you get the mitral regurgitant volume now how do we calculate that you can first of all calculate the left ventricular outflow tract flow the ba basic calculation that if you want to calculate flow then you multiply the area of the orifice into the velocity now what you do it you zoom on the left ventricular outflow tract in the peristernal long axis view and you take the left ventricular outflow tract diameter like this which we have shown in the second step you go into the four chamber view five chamber view and you uh, take a left ventricular outflow pulse wave doppler at the lvot and then you calculate the flow uh, area is pi r square into the vti which is in this case at 18 and this is you derive it to reach a flow of 56 ml so 56 ml is the stroke volume for this particular case now the second step second step you again you want to calculate the mitral valve inflow uh, the flow which is going at the mitral valve so you again say use the same formula flow is equal to area into the velocity or velocity time integral we come to the VTI in this case is 14.6 and the mitral valve analysis is 4.6 this is an example which has been taken and if you calculate the pi r square into the VTI which is 14.6 you come to a figure of 243 ml so this is the flow at the mitral valve and you subtract 56 ml which was the stroke volume of flow at the aortic valve from this 243 which is the combination of true stroke volume and the regurgitant flow and you reach you can see this in a you know a simplified manner so LVOT stroke volume of the true stroke volume is 56 ml the mitral valve stroke volume of the false stroke volume is 243 ml the regurgitant volume therefore is 243 minus 56 which is 187 ml once you have 187 here then to derive the fraction is easy because you uh, you divide this 187 regurgitant volume by the mitral valve stroke volume and you get a fraction of 77 percent which is severe mitral regurgitation but obviously if there is an associated aortic regurgitation then what you calculate at this aortic valve as a stroke volume will be different it you cannot use this uh, equation uh, if there is a presence of significant aortic regurgitation uh, now <coughs> this is what is known as proximal isovelocity surface area imagine that you know you have kitchen sinks in your uh, kitchen where if you pour a lot of water then the water will come down and it has to go through the drain which is a very narrow orifice so as the water rushes down that drain there is a creation of uh, iso velocity or iso tax iso velocity hemispheres which means that along a line or hemisphere the velocities will be equal now if we calculate the flow of this uh, flow at the hemisphere then we can by the law of conservation whatever flow is there of this hemisphere will be the flow across the mitral valve also because that is where it has to go so in principle the 
it is again the mitral valve flow will be equal to aortic valve flow and in the PISA method the advantage is that it is independent of machine settings that means it is not dependent on the gain or load or loading conditions therefore it is a very precise method if done properly and flow rate is calculated from the conservation of mass by multiplying the surface area of this iso velocity hemisphere by the speed <coughs> of flow passing through it. So you can see this that uh, when the blood flows across a narrow orifice or in a regression then it causes this kind of a hemisphere which you can see you can see here and if you want to measure the mitral valve area of this regurgitant orifice then we use uh, the uh, equation which you can see here of uh, 2 pi r square which is the area of a hemisphere so 2 pi is 6.28 r square <coughs> the radius of this hemisphere which I had shown which is this radius and then the we multiply it with the aliasing velocity okay so this is flow just concentrate on this upper equation here the this is 2 pi r square into the aliasing velocity do, do not go into the angle correction because we are assuming that the mitral valve is flat when the regurgitation occurs but since the mitral valve is not flat so there you have to do the angle correction but for the concept understanding forget this angle here so it is 2 pi r square into the aliasing velocity aliasing velocity you can see here is uh, the velocity which we get from a color coding now when you get a regurgitant jet all that you have to do is you have to decrease this color scale down to towards the blue so that the you achieve the aliasing velocity at around you know at whatever velocity you get you will start seeing a change in the color of the mitral regurgitation ice this uh, hemisphere which you make at the top of the uh, jet and the moment you reach the aliasing velocity you lower the color coding the, the there will be a change in the color of the mitral uh, regurgitant jet and you can see a very nice uh, round hemisphere from which you can calculate the radius this is a little tricky you have to do it on your own to understand it well but then the basic principle is that the flow at the PISA <coughs> surface is equal to the to the regurgitant flow so we can cal calculate the effective regurgitant orifice which in this case turns out to be 0.25 centimeters square now once you have the orifice the regurgitant orifice then the second step is to find out the regurgitant volume you know that the if we uh, multiply the area into velocity then we get the flow rate or the volume so we come we multiply this effective regurgitant orifice which we derived from PISA and we take a continuous Doppler across the mitral regurgitant jet to obtain the maximum mitral regurgitant VTI which is this you f take a continuous Doppler get the jet of the mitral regurgitation and you map this to obtain the VTI and you multiply this VTI into the ERO to obtain the regurgitation volume and regurgitation fraction as earlier I have said the volume divided by the total stroke volume at the mitral valve will give you regurgitation fraction now as I already said that it is technically difficult so uh, but the, you have to understand the basic concept here now in summary you have severity of the mitral regurgitation can be qualitative which is color jet area which we have seen less than 20 percent of the LA area more than 40 percent of the LA area is severe vena contractor width less than 0.3 is mild more than 0.7 is severe coming on to quantitative we have talked about regurgitant volume which is less than 30 mild more than 60 severe regurgitant fraction less than 30 mild more than 50 percent is severe and <coughs> we have also cal calculated the regurgitant orifice area and obviously you have do not forget 
the to look at the LA size, the left atrium size, and the left ventricular size, which will definitely be increased in case of severe mitral regurgitation. And there are some other criteria which you should see or look for. That is, uh, if you put a, a Doppler at the pulmonary vein, then you can see a pulmonary vein systolic flow reversal. Also, more dense the continuous wave Doppler of the mitral regurgitation the more chances of it being severe. And of course, if there is an eccentric mitral regurgitation jet which is reaching the posterior wall of the left atrium or swirling in the LA, then it is indicative of severe mitral regurgitation. Now, definitely once the patient has had the diagnosis of severe mitral regurgitation and he satisfies the indications of uh, the surgery, then repair can be offered and of course mitral valve replacement can be done and echo comes handy even, even in those conditions. You can see that this is a mitral, the ball and cage valve at the mitral valve where you can see a very nicely moving ball and cage valve at the mitral position and a bileaflet valve. You can see the two leaflets opening up very nicely here and uh, you can assess the post-surgical, surgically the assessment of the mitral prosthetic heart valve. Thank you very much, sir. Actually, uh, I think uh, you have uh, described it very well, uh, the very difficult topic. But still, I think a uh, few topic like uh, PISA, that student may be confused uh, as you also told uh, uh, that the topic itself, concept itself is very difficult. So, students are requested to practice it. <coughs> there are independently. Sir, would you like to say something to let make me? Uh, let me uh, put this whole thing in perspective. You see, the most important things when you talk of mitral regurgitation is the size of the left atrium and the left ventricular function and size. Both are important. I mean, you may have a very good ejection fraction and MR and a poor ejection fraction and less MR. So those things have to be put into perspective. In a busy echocardiography lab, it's important just to look at vena contracta and to look at regurgitant fraction or look at a jet left atrial ratio. That is enough. To give you a good idea of how much mitral regurgitation there is actually going on. If there is any confusion, if there is any thinking that this could be more or less or we are missing a jet which may be wall hugging, then it is important to do a transesophageal echo. Because a transesophageal echo, the echo is the transducer is lying just behind the left atrium. As you know, the left atrium is a posterior structure. It is so sometimes with a transthoracic approach, you may be and there's a thick wall chest, you may not be able to pick up the jet so well. Generally, you will. In those situations, it's not a bad idea to quantify mitral regurgitation by doing a transesophageal echo. And you'll be surprised many a times when we want to take a patient for a balloon mitral valvotomy and we want to rule out uh, important, as it is called, it's called important mitral regurgitation, how handy transesophageal is. Because sometimes a jet is coming posteriorly not seen by transthoracic echo. So remember, assessment of mitral regurgitation as an isolated entity is important. As an entity which is accompanying mitral stenosis, it's also important. Another thing that comes in mitral regurgitation many times is people say, you know, it's very operator dependent. When the patient came in, uh, the echocardiographer told us that it's severe mitral regurgitation and now it has become after five days, now it has become mild. It's saying that it was, first it was severe and then it was mild. Of course it can happen. When a patient comes, let's say, in a flash pulmonary edema because of hypertension, he develops MR and TR, his pressures are high, and at the time, the regurgitation may be low, or may be high, regurgitation. At the, but, but remember, the valve reflex will be normal, the morphology will, anatomy will be normal. After treatment, blood pressures come down, heart function improves, the mitral regurgitation becomes very less. This is very, very commonly known. So, it is not operator dependent. It's just that you have treated the patient well because as Dr. Vinayak told you, MR depends a lot on the loading conditions. So it's important to note what the loading conditions were. If you take mitral regurgitation in the operating room with a pressure of 100 by 70 and when you saw the patient at 140 by 70, they'll say there is hardly any mitral regurgitation. So loading conditions are important. So these are some stray thoughts which come to mind when you look at mitral regurgitation. But these thoughts have to be with you when you are evaluating a patient and giving a final diagnosis uh, to the relative that should the patient go for surgery or not. 
think of francis of age electrocardiography think of different positions in you which you may brought out now acute mitral regurgitation is is something which de uh, deserves attention because here the left atrium may not be large however the mitral regurgitation may be, may be quite uh, quite extensive and that's because let's say coronary rupture for example <coughs> coronary rupture gives rise to acute mr but the la is not large it's a non compliant left atrium all the pressures go straight on to the pulmonary venous side and the patient goes in acute pulmonary edema but when you look at the echo you say oh there is huge <coughs> there is uh, severe mitral regurgitation but the la is not enlarged so you have to look at several things it is not necessary that a significant mr or a, as it is called severe mr will also have large la it may not an acute mr is one of those situations also when as dr relax said look at the morphology of the left left uh, the of the mitral valve you may find a flagellar mass and that may tell you that this is a infective endocarditis lesion you may find mitral valve prolapse the only way to diagnose these conditions is by echocardiography either transesophageal or transthoracic but transthoracic should give you enough information that you may not require a semi invasive test to be done <clears throat> so just as dr vinay has told you in detail about the pisa method very very important but these are generally reserved for when you are looking at research methodologies for day to day work in a busy echocardiography lab without missing much the vena contractor what do you say the size of the vena contractor and the ratio of left atrium left atrial size and the jet width should give you a very good information okay but do take into consideration the left ventricular ejection fraction that's important so uh, thank you very much sir actually the main issue here is normally people have complained that all the clinicians have got my myopic visions but the main issue is whenever you are assessing mitral regurgitation not only uh, uh -huh. looking into the bulb you have to consider any many other issues as sir earlier told don't jump directly on into the uh, echocardiography try to assess the history clinical examination ecg and later on you correlate along with the all issues you have to look in this uh, mitral regurgitation <coughs> as a global aspects not into the only the bulb area or whatever the amount of the regurgitation uh, so here we will uh, conclude this session so thank you very much to all of you